Hello and welcome to the second video on Groundhog, a geotechnical Python package. In this video, we'll be talking about soil profiles and how you can quickly work, to, uh, work with them through Groundhog. We will go over what soil profiles are and what types of operations we want to do with them. Then I'll cover how Groundhog encodes soil profiles so that you can easily manipulate them and work with them in geotechnical analyses. Soil parameter selection is something which we commonly do and which is something that Groundhog has functionality built in for. Then finally, we all want to create instructive plots. So I'll show you how to generate soil profile plots from Groundhog soil profiles. First of all, soil profiles, uh, if we look at them, we all know them as geotechnical engineers. They're really common and they present, represent the stratigraphy of a given location, possibly with some laboratory testing results, with some interpreted parameters. It really depends on the application. If you, for instance, have a simple stratigraphic borehole log, there will be less information in there than in a geotechnical log that is used for pile design, for instance. So each application has its specific nature. In Groundhog, soil profiles are implemented using the soil profile class. And the soil profile class was built on the pandas data frame uh, class. If you don't know pandas, I suggest that you check out the package because it offers a lot of useful functionality to work with tabular data. In addition to the functionality provided by the pandas data frame, we now have a couple of additional methods and functions which are available to us if we encode soil profile information as a Groundhog soil profile. There's also a couple of requirements. When we encode a soil profile, we need to specify which column contains the coordinates of the top of the layer and which column contains the coordinates of the bottoms of the layer. Depth from and depth to are the defaults but we can equally use imperial units as well. Groundhog was customized to allow that too. If you want to plot soil types, you will need to have a column soil type, which contains strings with the soil type, sand, clay, silt, rock, perhaps something more complex like a geological formation. That's possible too. Overburden stress calculations are required in many geotechnical applications. And if you specify the column total unit weight, then you're set for good overburden calculations further down the line. We can add any number of soil parameters as additional columns to a Groundhog soil profile. There's a couple of conventions there too. Numerical soil parameters need a unit between square brackets. So the syntax is soil parameter name, QT in this example, open square brackets, the units, MPA for megapascal, close square brackets. Soil parameters which are, for instance, categorical, like relative density categories, loose, medium dense, dense, these don't have these units between square brackets. And Groundhog will recognize numerical, numerical parameters by these square brackets, so be careful to only include square brackets for numerical input. If your input is unitless, just open square bracket, then draw a horizontal line and close the square bracket again to indicate that this parameter is unitless. Linear variations, so linear increases from the top to the bottom of a layer are also allowed by adding from and to keywords to the soil parameter. In this example, you can see that the cone resistance has a value at the top of the layer, QC from MPA, and a value at the bottom of the layer, QC2 MPA. It's needless to say that if you specify a column with from, so QC from, that you need a corresponding column with QC2, otherwise the import of the soil profile might fail. How do we get our soil profiles into Python through Groundhog? Well, we can simply read them from Excel. I've said in a previous video that I don't like Excel for engineering calculations, but if you simply want to type in tabular data, I think Excel still provides useful functionality. 
So you can simply open up a workbook and begin by typing in the column headers. So your depth from, your depth to, these are required, a soil type column and a total unit weight column. And then here in this example, there's a relative density column, categorical, and a QC column too, actually, because it's a linearly increasing parameter, and also a column for QT, the total cone resistance. We need to ensure that our layers are continuous so that there's no overlaps or gaps. And um, finally, that constitutes a fully defined soil profile. The read Excel function from the soil profile module is then used to read in this uh, soil profile. And then you, you have it available in your Python code or in your Jupyter notebook for further manipulations. If you want to dump the contents of a soil profile into a file, you can equally use the to Excel method, which is the same method as the pandas to Excel method, to dump the contents of a soil profile into an Excel file. We can also import soil profiles program programmatically, that might be required too. And we can do that by passing a dictionary to the soil profile constructor. That dictionary has the column names as the keys and the values are lists, all lists of equal length, with the values of the parameters. So in this example, the first layer is a layer of sand, the second layer is a layer of clay, third one silt, and so on. Again, you can add as many soil parameters as you want. If you want to change values programmatically, you need to use the pandas syntax for that, and I invite you to check out the documentation on that. I won't cover that in this video. Once the soil profile is encoded, we can retrieve some information from it. So for instance, minimum and maximum depth, the depth of the shallowest layer at the top, and the depth of the deepest layer at the bottom. These are simply following from these min depth and max depth. Um, uh, attributes. We can find which numerical soil parameters are present in our soil profile and which uh, string soil parameters are present. And then if we have a numerical soil parameter, we can check whether it varies linearly or not with the check linear variation method by passing in the uh, soil parameter name. So here our QC is varying linearly our QT from the previously shown profile is not varying linearly. In some applications, fence diagram plotting, for instance, which I will show later on, we need to set a position for our SO profile. And we can do that with the set position method, which accepts an easting, a northing, and an elevation. We also need to define which coordinate system we're using. Here, coordinates, system, coordinate systems which have meters as units are preferred because some of the calculations in the fence diagram plotting are based on such systems. We can also specify a datum. By default, uh, meter LAT is encoded since I mainly work in offshore applications and meter LAT is the default datum there. We can also change the depth axis. Um, by default, depths in Groundhog are increasing uh, towards the bottom, but there are certain applications where we want to see, um, well, where we want to change the vertical reference. We can change that with the shift depths method or where we want to see vertical coordinates decreasing with depth. We can do that with the convert depth sign method. We have to be a little bit careful when using these methods because, for instance, if you have a Jupyter notebook and you would execute the shift depth method multiple times, like here, if you uh, execute that profile to shift depth minus 5 twice, you will shift the profile by minus 10 meters. So there is an alteration to the soul profile which can only be undone by again shifting it backwards by the same amount. Also, if you uh, use the convert depth sign function, uh, you need to be careful because um, all of the soil profile functionality was built with vertical coordinates increasing with depth in mind. So most of the functionality will actually only work if that is the case. 
So convert the depth sign, I really only use it for presentation purposes. If we want to do overburden calculations, this is really easy with Groundhog. Since we have the column total unit weight, um, we simply need to know where the water table is. By default, the water table is at ground surface, zero meters, and then everything can be calculated. We just need to ensure that any layer above the water table has the dry unit weight encoded as the total unit weight. Any layer below the water table needs to have the saturated bulk unit weight as the total unit weight. So the calculate overburden method takes an additional argument water table, which is a position of the water table, but by default it's zero. And here you can see that by executing this statement, all of the effective and total stresses plus hydrostatic pressures follow automatically. If we want to select soil parameters, we do that by passing a number of depths with corresponding values to the soil profile and saying to the soil profile to, according to which rule the trends need to be selected. So here you can see a soil profile, profile 3, being defined first. So that soil profile has um, depth from depth to soil types, etc. And then we generate um, 25 depths between 1.1 and 2.9 meters. This is the position of the clay layer. And then we randomly generate SU values around a certain trend. If you look at these SU values, then you will see that they will follow the linear trend, trend 20 plus 20 times and then a random number. Um, and if we want to select the trend based on this uh, random variation, we simply say that we want to select soil parameters for the parameter SU. We pass the depths at which the values are given, we pass the values itself, and we tell the algorithm according to which rule the soil parameter needs to, select, needs to be selected. Here we will select a mean trend with linear variations allowed, so SU can vary between top and bottom of the layer. And when we execute that, we can see that two additional columns are created, SU from and SU2 with the KPA units, and the, uh, the value which was selected at the top was 27 point something and the value at the bottom 31 point something. We also have the possibility to select minimum values or maximum values, so for lower bound and upper bound trends, but these only work with constant soil parameters uh, up till now. So then we need to set linear variation to false. It also happens that instead of having a soil profile, we need to have our output on a regular grid. And so that's where the gridding functionality with map soil profile comes in. Um, we generate a grid with, um, with um, regular depth coordinates. And then we say that the soil profile needs to be mapped to that grid. In the example, which you also see in the Jupyter Notebooks online, we can map the soil profile to a grid with 0.5 meter spacing, and we can see that all of the properties follow the specification given in the soil profile. So what is returned grid is actually a pandas data frame, which gives us the values of each soil parameter versus depth. This is very useful functionality. We also want to make graphical representations of our soil profile, and Groundhog uses Plotly as the plotting backend. The advantage of Plotly is that plots are interactive. The, com uh, the syntax is not complex, but we do need to install the Plotly package. It's not included in Anaconda by default. But if you simply type in conda install Plotly or pip install Plotly, you will get Plotly onto your system in no time. Several plots are possible. First of all, I'll show you how to plot a soil profile with selected soil parameters in each layer. But then you can also create mini logs or put multiple mini logs in a fence diagram. Most of the complexity of plotting is hidden from the user. So most of the actual plotly syntax is hidden in the groundhog function modules. But what the user needs to specify is simply the parameters that he wants to plot and what the plot needs to look like.
The basic syntax of a plot showing parameters versus depth is that we need to specify which parameters we want to plot in which panel. So we can create plot with plots with multiple panels and a mini log on the left. Here you see a plot with two panels, the unit weight on the left and QC and QT on the right. So first of all, what we need to specify in the plot profile method is which parameters we want to plot. And then we open a list, so the list of panels, and in the first list, we put total unit weight. So we put another list in there for the first panel. So in the first panel, we only plot a single parameter, total unit weight in kilonewtons per meter cubed. So then we again close that list, and that's all we need in the first panel. In the second panel, we're going to need two sole parameters, QC and QT. So we simply specify those, then close the list. And this defines everything that we want to plot, so we can close off our parameters list. Next, we need to define whether we want to show legends for these uh, traces or not. The unit weight trace is the only trace on panel 1, so there we don't show the legend. But on panel two, we have two traces, so we show the, tra the legend for QC and QT. Then we need to specify a list with the x-axis titles of the panels. We can use latex there, if you're fond of latex. And then um, also a title for the depth axis, again latex enabled. And then finally we finish off with setting ranges for the x-axis. So here the unit weight varies between 15 and 22 kilonewtons per meter cubed, and the cone resistances vary between 0 and 60 megapascals. For the mini log, we need to ensure that the program knows which soil types to map to which colors. That's where fill color dict comes in, and the fill color dictionary maps the soil types. So you'll see in the soil profile that there's a soil type sand, soil type clay and soil type silt, it maps it to colors. And here you can indeed see that the sand is plotted as yellow, the clay as brown and the silt as green. We can reduce that syntax to obtain mini logs because if you don't plot any parameters, the parameters list is just empty. It contains an empty list of parameters because there's no additional panels. And we just need to set the Z axis title and range, and then the fill color dict, of course. Here I slightly tweaked the color to have light yellow for the sand. Finally, we can plot fence diagrams, and to plot fence diagrams, so projection of soil profiles onto a line, we need to ensure that our soil profiles are georeferenced using the set position method. Once the position is set, we can plot the soil profile versus depth and then we can nicely see the projection of these profiles onto a profile line. So the algorithm will also show the offset between the profile line and the actual soil profile position. And we can select the profile line based on two uh, soil profiles or based on two sets of coordinates. There is an example notebook, Fence Diagrams with Groundhog, which you can check out for more detail on this. So that's it for this tutorial on using soil profiles. It's really a key element of the functionality of Groundhog and I hope you enjoy using it. If you have some feedback or you want to make Groundhog better, just give us um, and just notify us on either one of these contact channels. Thank you.